And today's broadcast is brought to you by Eclectic Horseman Magazine. Stay tuned for Eclectic Conversations, hosted by Emily Kitchen. Thanks for joining us today. I'm here to speak with Juliana Avila about her book, Fine Horses and Fair-Minded Riders. Thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us about your book today. Oh, thank you for having me. This is such an honor. Well, I have to start by saying um, this book really was a challenge for me to read. It's been a long time since I've been in, in college and the level of um, the crafting of your wording and the structuring of the thought, like I loved it. And because it really made me think and examine a lot of things that I live with every day, but I hadn't really like thought about the, the big picture of them. So like, let's start by just telling us, telling our viewers a little bit about like what inspired you to write this book. Yeah. So, you know, I, I start the book with this anecdote, right? I sort of inherited this mare. I was um, in a relationship with a horse trainer, um, but he was, he was an educator, I'd say more than a trainer, but anyway, we broke up. And so then the question became, you know, what to do with this mare. And she was, as I say in the book, spirited. So she was, she was a handful and she was older, you know, she'd passed through a number of hands. And so he wanted to just sell her. And I just, for some reason, I just became so attached to her and I didn't ride her. I didn't work with her. You know, I really didn't have all that much to do with her. Um, when we were in this relationship, but for some reason, I just formed an attachment to her. And I, all I can think of is she really reminded me, I'd been around horses briefly when I was about like in second grade, we moved to Arizona from Los Angeles and I'd been given a horse, um, by my friends, my family friends who owned a ranch. And so she reminded me, I'd been given a filly and the, she reminded me, Angel reminded me of the mama. And so that's all I can think is that somewhere in my brain, you know, that I had this, this, um, she just reminded me of this horse. So I became attached to her, but it, then the question, I mean, I had no experience, right. As an adult with horses and I was in North Carolina, so I didn't know the local horse scene. I mean, I didn't know anything about boarding. And so, but I just wanted to keep her. I just was afraid of what, about what would happen to her. Um, and, and, you know, probably as a rebellious female myself, I just wanted to protect her, right? Like she, you know, she was a kindred spirit. And so, you know, with some advice from my um, graduate advisor, I figured out boarding. And so I, I got that part done, but then the question was, well, what do I do with her? And so it just started with an honest curiosity. So I, I audited one of Buck Brandeman's clinics in Clemson, and this was years and years ago. And you know, I drove back and forth every day from Charlotte to Clemson. And a thought that I had at the end of it was um, in my inexperienced brain that the riders looked to me like, and I, I wouldn't have used the word vaquero at the time. Um, I probably thought to myself, they look like Mexican cowboys. And I just wondered why is that? And so this is just the material, right? The saddles and the, and the tack. And I, so I was just very curious about that because here I am in South Carolina and I'm thinking, you know, they look so familiar to me culturally as, as my mom was Latina. And so, um, I just wondered about that. I got really interested in that. So, and I started just talking to people, um, and just asking, you know, what is the style and, you know, of course he uses the word vaquero on his website. And so that sent me down that path. But I just started talking to people who would then recommend that I talk to other people who were interested, you know, um, in the style sort of loosely defined, right, um, and a modern version of it. But it just sent me down that path. And so it took me years, you know, to of talking to people and, and before I formulated an idea about studying it more formally. Mm -hmm. And um, but it really did just start with, you know, a wondering as I think I describe it in the book I just wondered mm -hmm. about it. and then the more that I learned the more fascinated I became because I thought it's so far you know I make this point over and over again in the book but it's so far from its origins right um it, in the southeast which is where I first started studying it and that it's that it has endured um especially when you know when most people don't own cattle or work cattle I mean it's it's just 
you know, started out as a working tradition and, and just how it's evolved. And I just became fascinated. And then I became fascinated with the people who um, study it. That, that was really, you know, key for me. And then the more I learned, the more that I wanted to know. And so I, you know, I started out as an outsider. I'd say I'm still an outsider. Um, but I just, I just thought it was so interesting. And I just, I just thought that the horse people who were studying it were fascinating. And then I came to really admire some of them for how, you know, they treat horses and the, the philosophy behind it. Okay. There's like a zillion questions. Um, right. so, like, <laughs> okay, I'm which direction? My monologue. <laughs> yeah, no. Was, um, so I guess my, I guess the first thing I want to ask, because the, the, the use of the term vaquero horsemanship is something that you come back to again and again, um, throughout the book. And so let's just, let's start there. So what does that term mean to you? And, 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 and how do you, did your feeling about that word change from the beginning of the project to the end? So I'd say my overall feeling, again, it, it wouldn't have been, I know what vaquero is, but I wouldn't have used it probably originally. Um, how I, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I, you know, I feel like um, its job in my project and in my book was to serve as sort of a common definition. Mm -hmm. So you can say to another horse person in many instances, not in all instances, but, you know, I'm interested in vaquero horsemanship and they, you have then some kind of a common fabric that you can work with. Right. Um, I will say, I know that there's not agreement about the term. I ha I had to settle on a term um, just for the sake of, you know, being able to do the project. And that seemed to me a decent one. You know, of course, Buck Brandeman uses it. And so I think that's because he was so influential with many of the people I spoke to in the Southeast that seemed like sort of a, a common sense term to also adopt, right? Um, I, I don't want to, again, as an outsider, I don't want to come in and say, well, I think you all should be using this term. So I tried to defer to what was already in use, yeah. even though there is disagreement about it, I realized that. And I ended up with, um, you know, when I say mixed feelings, like I realize some people, you know, we all have our assumptions about it and in different parts of the country, especially. And, you know, I... <laughs> it really just was a starting point for me. So when I was interviewing people, I'd say, you know, this is what I'm calling it. And I realize you may have a different definition. Um, I'd be hard pressed to just give you a single definition of it even. And I wouldn't feel comfortable saying this is my definition because I feel like it's up to the people who are practicing it and learning it and experts in it, which I am certainly not. So it was just a starting point. Yeah. And, I felt well, like and, and part of the reason I ask is because like as somebody who, deals with trying to describe what I do <laughs> for the last 25 years. Um, like I understand that like choosing the right word is fraught with so many like pluses and minuses. So like, I, I'm like, well, how did she figure it out? So. <laughs> well, and I mean, I used your word eclectic because I actually <laughs> think that is spot on as a literacy person. I was like, Oh, Emily, I think that <laughs> perfect and you know probably in many ways preferable because it's more open-ended you know and and um so I think it goes alongside with it if you hadn't already taken it I might have <laughs> well but I do mention you in the book and I mentioned how appropriate that word is because it you know it it I did find of course as I was interviewing people especially when I moved out west and I started interviewing people outside of the southeast when I when I used the phrase back at a horsemanship I did run into more assumptions that weren't necessarily I mean they're just there's a lot of variation in how people use it right and so in a way calling it modern vaquero horsemanship is a is a bit of a cheat because I'm just saying well I'm you know I don't necessarily have to this doesn't necessarily all fall in line with the historical definition but it doesn't I mean it is it has evolved and so but yeah as, as a writer you're just trying to figure out like what what label can I give it that we can, then we can all go from there, you know? Well, and like I, I studied sociology in college and along with journalism. And so like, it was interesting, like I found so much of what you're writing about as far as like the values of the group and the, and it was like, gosh, I mean, there's so many things that I hadn't really, it's like you, you intuitively have a sense of them, 
but like you articulated them so well. Oh, that means so much to me because again, I see myself as a perpetual outsider. And so as an academic, it's tricky too. I mean, obviously I love horses. I had um, a, such a genuine interest in the folks that I interviewed. And I think people sense that, right? I mean, it was, I just thought that they were fascinating. And so, but, you know, again, as an academic outsider, you are, I struggled with, you know, portraying people accurately um, because you're just, as you know, you know, you're using excerpts from their interviews and it's just, it needs to be very careful, thoughtful work because I take people's stories extremely seriously. And the fact that they trust me with their stories, and of course, some of them are named and some of them are anonymous, but um, I take that so seriously. I think that is really a privilege to be able to convey parts of people's stories. And so I really, I worked hard on that part. Well, and that was one thing that I really loved about um, this really intense uh, examination of of concepts and ideas. And then the horse stories interspersed, like it was such a beautiful balance and it felt like, okay, like I can, I can, can like let the, like I can soak on what just came before. And then I can appreciate these stories, like beautifully crafted how you, how you did that. Oh, thank you. I actually had that idea very late in the project. And of course, by then I was under contract. And so I had deadlines and I just thought it would be so, I was, I was aware while I was writing it, you know, it's an academic project. And so I did try to make it as accessible as I can, but I can only do so much. And so I had that idea because I just love the stories that people were telling me. And if I did another follow-up project, it would be just tell me the stories about the horses who, who have been influential. I think that would be, I think it would just be so interesting and it's so touching, right? It's so emotionally affecting to hear about. And I found that people were, they loved describing those, right? Um, but just to hear about the horses also, you know, the other thing was that the horses are silent in the book. Right. And so that for me was a way of, of bringing them in. Um, but I had it late. And so I had to kind of scramble. Um, but I'm so glad I did, because I think I imagine for a lot of people, that's probably one of the more interesting aspects of the book. And I could have done, I wish I could have done more with that. I think that that part was really beautiful. So let's, um, and I'm not quite sure how to broach the subject, but so for people who might have an idea about what an academic work is or what academics are, who may have never spoken with an academic, like, right. to get, like tell us a little bit about what that means and, and, and maybe what the, the rigors and standards are of that work so that we can have a better feel of that. Yeah. So, you know, it means when you do a project like this, um, there are very strict expectations and guidelines. So I have to go through something called human subjects at the university. They have to approve all of my approaches and methods, my interview protocols, um, whether I name people or I don't. Generally, you don't name people. So I had to jump through a lot of extra hoops to be able mm -hmm. to name some people who I thought might want to be named. Um, and so, you know, you have other people kind of okaying what you do all, all along the way. Um, and in your own mind, just as an academic, you have your own standards, right? So I, you know, I struggled a lot with the fact that this book isn't going to be representative. Um, and so that's kind of a funny thing about the title, because I originally wanted to call the book um, something very different like that that specified that it was in the southeast mm -hmm. right and so i think it was something like um you know maybe just modern vaquero horsemanship living and learning or no wouldn't it maybe just living and learning you know modern vaquero horsemanship in the southeastern united states and beyond and the marketing folks at purdue were like uh no and <laughs> so <laughs> they they wanted something you know and i get it it's the marketability part right but what makes me uncomfortable about the title i'll be very honest with you is that it sounds like a survey of modern vaquero horsemanship and it's not mm -hmm. there were lots of people i didn't talk to so that's part of an academic project is that you take a fairly small group of people and you concentrate intensely on them but then of course you leave out a whole other range of experiences right and i and i'm acutely aware that there were people that i 
you know, wish I could have included, but within the parameters of my study, they didn't fit. So the mentors that I chose were people that were mentioned specifically by my original group of participants. And that might seem weird to people. Like, why didn't you just talk to so-and-so? Because you know, they're, you know, a big name in this, this part of the horse world. And I couldn't, I mean, I just, I had to stay within my yeah. parameters. And so it's working perhaps within really, you know, stricter confines than people might realize as an academic, if that makes sense. And well, so and I, th I think you did a great job. Like, I felt like I understood that going, going in and I felt like, honestly, it was a little bit um, like more manageable because you go, it's not this huge bite because it's not worldwide. It's this, you know, this narrow focus. So uh, I felt like I was, that was clear to me in, in the reading right. of the book. I'm uh, glad I, I did. I, I fretted about that because I, again, I feel like there were some people that I left out that I wish I could have included, but as an academic, you can't just say, I want to include so-and-so because I want to. Whereas if you were just writing it on your own, you could, right? You can say, I include whoever I want. Like you, you know, I can interview whoever I want, but I, I set the parameters. And so I had for the sake of, of rigor and consistency and accountability, mm -hmm. um, because there's just this kind of built-in accountability to being an academic. I had to stick within those. And then was this part of like work that you were doing like within the university? Like just because I don't have a clear, like, right. or was this, yeah, tell me about that. Oh, it was a total passion project. Um, fortunately, as an academic, so I, I like to say that, you know, when you get a PhD, you don't necessarily, you don't usually make the money that an MD makes, but one thing that, that you're paid with is freedom. And so you do have the freedom to, to choose projects that are within your, you know, your kind of academic background. So because I come from literacy studies, that's huge, right? I mean, you can almost, you, you can define so many things as having to do with literacy. And so I was just able to work on it. It did, it was completely new for me, which is one reason it took me so long because I started doing these interviews probably nine years ago, a long time ago in the Southeast. Mm -hmm. And they took me a long time for two reasons. One is that people were spread out and I could only travel to, I like to do in-person. I prefer mm -hmm. to do in-person. And so I could only travel to some, you know, somebody like once a month. And so that's one reason. The other reason it took so long is because I was doing all my other university work. And so it didn't fit in at all, except when once I was done, I realized it is an extension of things I've already been interested in, like expertise and basically how people are motivated to learn on their own mm -hmm. without necessarily a lot of, so out of school adults learning and they are propelled by passion. So what does that look like? You know, especially when it's hard to, to tap into resources like it is in the Southeast and people are, you know, far apart. Um, so in, in, it is a continuation of things I've been interested in. I would say an expansion. So it made me grow as an academic as well. So tell me a little bit about what literacy studies encompasses just so that I know um, so you know it, it it of course encompasses the kind of basic reading and school writing that we would think of right learning to read but as a more modern again you know iteration of it it can also include just the way we make sense of the world um, with literacy um, how it empowers us or or disempowers us how it leads to access you know there's interesting work about the physicality of it. Um, you know, so what I describe in the book, I think is a kind of literacy, how people become literate with horses, even though a lot of that is silent. And so we don't think of it as, you know, wouldn't necessarily think of it as literacy, but that now is, would be considered a form of literacy that, that these folks became literate in horsemanship. And so, and of course, you know, print, plays a role, but it doesn't play the role that it does in school. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would say using language to communicate in the world um, and get the work done that you want to get done, but also to grow and so, and to challenge yourself. Cool. That's a hard, that's a hard okay. question. Well, that's good. I mean, like my, my, my mom's a reading specialist and my sister's a speech, a speech okay. uh, pathologist. And so like I, and you know, my husband's father was a professor. And so like, I, I have like just a huge deep respect for education. And then like, as we start to, we've been doing these online classes and I'm, so I'm, I'm really trying to, like, I'm trying to grow as somebody who's like sharing education just through print and video to now expanding the sort of interactive learning. And 
it's been just a huge, you know, so this is sort of like a question just like for my own, like ah. how can I like learn from what, you know, like it's all like, you're always learning from other people, how you can do what you're doing better. So. It, yeah. I, and I think, you know, I know that, that um, I think that you do, you do video sessions, mm -hmm. right? So like of Tom Curtin, where you video like him working with horses. So that to me is all literacy. That is a form of literacy, that communication with the horse, with other people. I think clinics are fascinating because that's literacy at work. So there you have the clinician communicating with the horse, but also communicating and trying to teach a group of people um, who all have their individual horses. To me, that's a very complex form of literacy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will say I started out as a reading specialist and a high school English teacher. So with a focus on adolescence. So I come from a traditional, I mean, my PhD is in language and literacy. And so I come from a fairly traditional conception of literacy, but it has expanded in the you know past few decades. And I think horsemanship certainly fits into that. Mm -hmm. Well, I loved, um, I loved the exploration of the different kinds of mentorship um, and I thought that was, was hugely fascinating. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that for folks who might be uh, interested in that. Yeah. So I, you know, what I found fascinating about that is just the, like you said, the different forms. So we think of a mentor as, you know, you go and work with somebody for a number of years, you're an apprentice, right? But that's not economically viable for a lot of people. And so what I found interesting was the creative ways that mentorship had been approached in, in Beckett horsemanship. So I think, you know, certainly the clinics, but those are few and far between, although, you know, the participants made the point that you learn so much in that short period of time, and then you have to kind of process it, you know, for the next however many months or maybe even a year. And so I think it, it challenges our traditional conceptions of learning. Um, so ideally, you know, I think some of them felt like, yeah, I'd love to be a traditional apprentice and and follow a mentor, but that that didn't happen very often because of life. And so there were all kinds of different ways, you know, people became mentored by books, but certainly other people and the biggest mentor was the horse. And so, you know, that that they were put themselves in that position where they were willing and humble. So humility is a huge theme in the book that came out of interviews, right? that really seems to mark the style of horsemanship and that they were willing to learn from the horse. Um, I think is, is that, I thought that was really, you know, amazing. I'm probably using the word amazing so much, but I just, I, I, I was so taken with the people that I talked to. I just thought the world of them. And so, um, but yeah, mentorship. So it was a flexible mentorship right? Which I think is more realistic. And one of the nice things is when you interview people about their life experiences, you can't necessarily impose, you shouldn't impose your own definitions. So mm -hmm. I would have thought of it as more traditional, right? A traditional apprentice mentor relationship. But when you ask people about it, and then you look carefully at their words, then I found, oh, they're actually describing all kinds of mentorship, which I think is, is, you know, gives people permission. So it's like, you know, you can define it how, how it works for you. And also I think I found that a lot of people were um, seeking different sorts of mentorship. So there would, there would be clinics if they could work with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, which was hard in the Southeast, just because of, you know, how far apart everybody is in this kind of subculture. Um, but the horses, you know, sometimes they formed, they would, kind of pair up with other people who were semi-close, right? That they could get to a few times a year to supplement. So they were really creative about mentorship. And I found that, I thought that was really interesting. Well, and I loved how you talked about like the, the expertise being on a continuum where like somebody might mentor somebody at first and then that person catch up and there, and then, you know, and I, I like, like, that's so real. I just loved that you explored that. I thought that was really interesting too. And I, again, that went with the humility. So it, it tended to be that, you know, the people that, that many people would say are mentors would see themselves still as learners, almost as if they had circled back. Right. So that's another metaphor I use, but there's a lot of kind of nonlinear movement in it. And meaning you kind of went back to probably how humble you were in the beginning, um, but for different reasons. And so I thought that was really interesting too. And to, you know, again, part of kind of a flexible mentorship that, you know, somebody, you didn't arrive right at expertise. You could, you could be a mentor to somebody else, but then you would go and be mentored at a clinic. And so I love that, that, that passion to continue learning. I thought that was so, 
that actually motivated me to go back to school. I was hugely affected by that part of the project that mm -hmm. that these folks who were so accomplished describe themselves as still being so eager to learn. And of course the horse is the reason, right? Because mm -hmm. you, several people said, you think you know it all. And then you meet a horse who <laughs> says, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't know what you think you know. And yeah. so that's, <laughs> And that reminded me of like teaching high school where, you know, you start feeling really confident and you just teaching in general, you start thinking, I know what I'm doing. And then you meet students who are like, no, you're not as good as you thought you were. So, um, but that they were open to that, I thought was remarkable, you know, that they didn't shut down because you certainly, you could get defensive and shut down and instead they seemed to open up to it, to the challenge. And so mm -hmm. I thought that that was impressive. Well, and that's, I mean, that's a, a commonality that I see in so many of the students and the people that are passionate about their horsemanship, like there is a different spark in them to where it is so important. And, and that's the, the little puzzle that I'm, you know, because it is so important to me, I want it to be important to everybody. I don't know if that's reality or not. I think it probably isn't. I feel like that as a teacher, I mean, I'm teaching for the first time ever, I'm teaching a class of a hundred students and most of them are freshmen and they're not English majors. They're not going to be teachers. And I just, I have to remind myself because I'm spoiled by working with people usually who want to be teachers who are in line with my own passions and, you know, about education. And I realize, you know, not everybody's going to be passionate about it. And so I imagine horsemanship just as a sample of the larger population, there isn't you know, going to necessarily be, and I was spoiled in this project because I was only talking to people who were passionate, right? So in that way too, it's not representative. Um, but they were, you know, I, I, yeah, I just, I thought it was really, um, you know, it motivated me as a learner. I just thought it was remarkable that, you know, sometimes decades in, um, you know, they were still so open to learning. Again, I know that's the horse, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's another gift the horse gives us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, talk a little bit about, like you end with this idea of like circular evolution. So talk a little bit about that because I thought it was a really great way to describe what's happened. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I felt like that, I mean, some of that is just my own, you know, kind of academic writer brain bringing a metaphor into play right I mean I but also I feel like because I'm trying to make sense of of the data as well right to me it's it's you know it's very personal but it's also data and so I'm trying to see you know what is there and I felt like that just in you know some of the stories that people told um you know it so starting from like you know um Bruce Sandifer and Jeff Derby going back to historical vector horsemanship so that to me and and being and I know that there's a a group within this that's passionate about preserving the historical methods right and so um that to me is a circling but then also um you know just the the focus on um, Greg Eliel's focus on working with veterans when this started out as a military form of horsemanship, um, I thought was just really interesting. And so it just seemed to, it seemed helpful to think of it as in a sense circling, but also not just, you know, the, the idea of evolving, right, came up. And so it's turned into something different, but it hasn't turned into something unrecognizable. So it it has changed, obviously, but it's not necessarily a linear path as I interpreted it, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's it's not completely moved in a straight line. And so I thought that that was compelling, you know, and so mm -hmm. I wanted to share that with the reader. I mean, people may disagree with me and say, oh, you know, that's your own interpretation. And I'd say, yeah, it's fair enough. It could be, but I felt like it was, there were el enough elements of that, that it seemed a valid way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I loved it. And I, I mean, there's times when I've had people who aren't horse people ask questions and they're like, so wait, the, the Dorrances were in Oregon. Like they're like, how does that connect to the Vaquero? You know, like, and yeah. you go, oh yeah, well, okay. Like I hadn't really you know, thought about it in, you know, so I think you did a great job of connecting those dots to where it's like you, you, you know, drew the lines of connection that sometimes you miss if you're just immersed in the culture. 
So, you know, I, I really struggled with that part because I, I ran into, when I started doing my interviews in the West, especially, you know, people would just say to me, you know, the Dorrances wouldn't have called themselves vaqueros, right? Hunt wouldn't have called himself a vaquero for, you know, because they would have associated it with a specific culture and, and not. And so I really had to think hard about, you know, um, I didn't want to seem like I was presenting them under that label, right? Because I, I, again, that's just obnoxious as an academic to come in from the outside and be like, well, these guys were, you know, I, I didn't want to do that. Um, but I, you know, I owe a debt of gratitude to Gwen Turnbull, who described how she thought they sort of got recruited into the tradition of vaquero horsemanship, even though they perhaps wouldn't have recruited themselves or used that label, right? Um, but that was a sticky part for me because, you know, they're not here to speak for themselves. And I didn't certainly didn't want to be presumptuous. And so I did try to clarify that for the reader. Mm -hmm. I did that by trying to just ask people like how, you know, how is it that, that, that now a new generation associates them with this, which in one name for it is Vaqueta horsemanship when they wouldn't necessarily have called themselves that, right? Because they had a different, they had different understandings of it. They were closer to um, a historical practice of it than we are now. And so I did try to wrangle that. I really mm -hmm. did. I'm, I, I hope it, I hope, and it sounds like it made sense to you. So I'm glad yeah. you saw that I was really, I, I tried to really be sensitive to that because I, yeah. I thought that that was, but it was a really sticky part. It, it kept me up some nights. I really struggled with it. <laughs> well, I think, I think you did a great job and I felt like, you know, it was, it was clarifying. And I think, and, and I feel like that, I should say that like your the whole like vibe of the book is like so respectful and so um I don't know you you you're you're translating and you're sharing but you're not uh imposing you know and I feel like that really comes through I'm so happy to hear that I would say you know traditionally as an academic you'd be more critical and I did not want I, I'll I'll be critical of elements of it like the consumerism mm -hmm. but I will not I feel like that would betray the people who trusted me with their stories so um, not that I was tempted to be critical, but that just what I just didn't even go there. Mm -hmm. And that could be that that could be labeled as a criticism against me as an academic that I wasn't critical enough mm -hmm. of my interviewees. But I thought, you know, I'm OK with that. I'm OK with that criticism mm -hmm. because I feel like it's most important to be respectful. Um, again, people are sharing their and, you know, people did not know me. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, so I am not in this culture or subculture. Um, and they were still willing to talk to me. And I think that's huge. And so you have to repay that with respect. Yeah. That's one question, but I want to, I want to, I'm going to come back to that. But, um, so talk a little bit about, because as somebody who creates horsemanship products, I read with great, like, okay, how's she going to handle this? The, the consumerism aspect. And I think that you were very like fair in how you categorize that, but just speak to that idea a little bit. That came out of one of my early interviews um, with an anonymous participant. So I won't say who that was, but, and it also came out across, then it started coming out across interviews, right? Um, just this critique of the consumerism and this idea. And of course I saw it at the clinic, right? And then that, then that was validated by folks who said, you know, people buy all of the gear and then they show up and they can't ride worth a damn. I think that was a, a quote, right? And so, and also they keep buying gear and they don't become better riders. That was another critique of, of some of their students. And so that just got me thinking about, so there's where my academic brain kicked in and I started thinking about kind of a larger societal context for that. So why might that be? Why might, why might there be such an emphasis on stuff mm -hmm. in horsemanship? Um, and I fell into it myself. You know, when I first got into horses, I wanted to buy everything. I had too much of stuff, right, that I hadn't even really earned and didn't need. Um, so I was, you know, I was a part of it. And so I just tried to widen the lens with that. And again, it's not particular to horsemanship, of course. I mean, I, I, it's very much part of our society. Um, and probably worldwide, but I think especially in the U.S. And also because of the the people that are, tend to get into horsemanship, a lot of, um, and I'm one of them, sort of a middle-aged woman with some extra income, right? So we've got more income now. You can spend it on hobbies. And so um, I think all of those factors came into it, but I just tried to apply some analysis to it, mm -hmm. right? So 
you know, we're all, we all, most of us fall prey to it. Um, it sounds like it's very different from how the Dorrance's were and, and perhaps Ray Hunt too. So it's, it's, I think it's probably more of a modern plague in a way, right. That we want to focus on it. But then again, you do need some quality stuff and there is, there is the the material tradition in Vaquero horsemanship of beautiful craftsmanship. So I, you know, I I brought that out as well. The interviewees talked to me about that. And of course we know that. And so, and I think you can have both. I mean, I think you can have respect and admiration for the beautiful material traditions of it. And then also realize that sometimes people use it as a shortcut mm -hmm. and they don't focus on the actual horsemanship. And so... I think we've probably gotten away from the idea of it being um, sort of a reward for you and the horse after you have achieved bridal horsemanship. And then you would have all this, you would have be justified in owning and, and sporting all of this beautiful tack. So, you know, you'll see people buying it right away, right? A bridal bit that they don't really know how to use. So that was a critique that came out is that, you know, people are using it again as a shortcut. So I just tried to explore it and its complexity. Mm -hmm. And I, I will say a nice thing about being an academic is that you don't necessarily have to resolve things, right? You can say, <laughs> here they are in their complexity, and we're just going to leave it like that, right? We're not going to try and come up with an answer. We're just going to try and explore it and think about it critically. So that's what I tried to do. Well, and I love that because it just, it made me go, huh, okay, let me think about, let me try that idea on for size. Let me, how does that fit into what I'm doing? And, you mm -hmm. know, just get those wheels turning. And, and, and the, I think one of the things that you talked about was like sort of that shorthand of identifying, like this person has similar values to me <clears throat> right. by seeing the gear. And, and I, like, I remember that feeling of going to the very first Californios roping and it's like, Hey, everybody's wearing a flat hat. Like, you know, and like, Hey, this is my, you know, like these people, we, we share right. these values. Yeah, you know, that's right. And I don't want to shortchange that because I think that's incredibly important, especially in horsemanship. Um, the community building that takes place through material things is I think very powerful for a lot of people. Right. And so, and I get that because, you know, horsemanship I mean if you're especially if you're in the southeast and you're by yourself and you you know you don't have a lot of of opportunities for community and so you go to something and that's how people kind of find each other because of the way they're dressed and the way their saddles look I'm I have no critique of that I mean I think that that's you know I totally get that as a human being and so that's another part of it that I think is you know so again I think I know I think it all of these critiques and questions can coexist, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think we can, we need, so like what you do, I think is very different because, you know, people do need resources. I mean, we don't live in a horse culture, a lot of us. And so we have to kind of construct these worlds and you need things to do that, right? You need tact, but you also need videos and you need books and you need technology. And so in the modern world, these things are how we learn many of us, right? We don't, necessarily have you know mentors close by and so you know that's I think what I was more focused on in terms of a critique was just again you know the people that buy all of the tack and they don't necessarily know how to use it um yeah but but not to say that we don't actually need a lot of the stuff that and that it you know it performs identity work for us it is that is really helpful yeah yeah okay I want to circle back to the thought I had when you were talking before about the interviews. So like how, um, how difficult was that to get people to be open? What did you find that a challenge? Was it individually variable? How, how did that go for you? Oh, you know, I would say generally it wasn't um, because people, so I, I think there was some skepticism about me. That's one reason I created a little website for myself, just because I know people were like, who the hell are you? Right. Because I wasn't, um, but I will say, you know, people opened the doors, like subsequent doors for me. So Susan Hopkins was somebody I interviewed early on. And of course, Susan knows everybody. So she, she would say, you know, talk to so-and-so and so-and-so. And then they would say, talk to so-and-so. So it was that word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so then when I'd approach somebody, I'd say, you know, so-and-so said I should talk to you. And of course then, um, and I think, you know, so I think there was skepticism, um, 
there was some worry that I was maybe a journalist and, and that I was going to, you know, um, they didn't know what I was going to do with their words. Right. And then I say, I'm an academic and I'm like, well, what does that mean? You're going to do with my stories. Right. Like, you know, just, um, but I would, I found overall people were very generous and open. And of course people like to, to talk about horsemanship. Right. And so, even if there was a little bit of, I think, hesitation in the beginning, everyone was very kind and polite. And also, I think it probably went a long way that I was willing to drive out to them wherever they were. So, you know, I'm not asking you, I, I know Zoom is uncomfortable for a lot of people. I didn't, I don't think I did. I don't know that I did. I think I did one interview via Zoom and then a couple phone calls just because of where folks were. Um, but I really did try to do it face to face because I feel like that says a lot to folks like I'm willing to drive out to you, um, you know, because I value sitting down with you and hearing your story. And so but overall, people were really generous and really open minded about it. And again, I think it comes down to, you know, who doesn't want to talk about <laughs> horses and horsemanship, right, to um you know, somebody that's just now I had an audio recorder. So that was something too. like, you know, I think there was probably some nervousness. And then I didn't do anything with the interviews for a lot of years. And so mm -hmm. then when I came back and, you know, it's like, it's going to be a book, I'm sure there was some trepidation about that, you know. Um, but I found I think horse people are, are generous. And so, you know, they I think they gave me the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure they had some private doubts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they had some private doubts until they read the book. And, you know, I don't know what people think of the book. And so I hope that they feel like I represented them fairly, but it is, you know, um, I'm sure they were wondering yeah. about. That. Well, that was one of my questions was, have you gotten any, but any feedback since it's, cause it's been out for like six months, maybe yeah, it's been out since yeah. April. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't really, I've gotten some feedback from people that um, I didn't interview. I've gotten some from some of the folks I interviewed that seemed to like it. Um, you know, and I tell them, don't read the whole thing, like skip the academic parts. Like in the beginning, you know, there's all that academic stuff. Like you don't need to read all of that. It's kind of boring. I had to do it, but um, you know, just read the parts that are interesting to you. I've gotten some, but I don't, I, I also haven't looked for it because I'm a little bit afraid. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I, I don't want to, if people didn't like it, I don't want to know because I worked, it's the hardest I've ever worked on any professional project. Um, it's probably twice the length that my dissertation was. I don't think I'll ever write a book again. It was, I found it incredibly challenging. And I think in no small part, because I cared so much about it, um, if I had cared less, it would have been a hell of a lot easier to write. But because I cared so much and I respected these people, I really agonized over every word. And so, and it's long, it was over a hundred thousand words. And so it's Purdue made it so small to fit. I'm like, God, the print is so small. Um, I had to put on my reading glasses. Oh my gosh, I know. I mean, I was, I, you know, that's this to say funny, right? But it's like, it's, it's long. And so, yeah, it was, it was really a challenge. So a lot of it, my not seeking out feedback is I'm exhausted. Like I just, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm just I get that. I totally get that. <laughs> if you didn't like it, I don't necessarily want to know because I, I really tried, I really tried very hard. Well, I think, I think that that really, it comes through in the work. I mean, it, it, it really does. So that, that part shines for sure. Um, gosh, that, I mean, that, that was a really great answer. Um, I do want to say, I did get a Facebook message from somebody I'd never met. And she said, I've been waiting for this book for years for somebody to represent what I'm interested in and what I'm curious about. And I thought, oh gosh, I hope other people have that feeling too. Cause I do, I do think there's a population that um, is interested in it, but, you know, perhaps doesn't know where to start. So I did try to point the way, you know, here's some people you can contact. And so um, I hope that it served that function as well for people that are feel isolated, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm interested in this tradition, but um, I'm not really connected to anybody else doing it. And so I think there was some validation and that makes me extremely happy. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're moving in a world that is not like your day job. You're not around horse people all the time. So do they ask you like, like, why, why do we still 
have horses? Why are they why are they important in this in this world? I mean, we like as horse people who so much of our lives is oriented around their care and our education and like all of that, it's um, sometimes easy to lose to not think about that from the outside world, they might go like, that's just crazy to spend all your time doing chores every day. So like, do you, do you, do people ask you that question from that uh, sort of removed experience? Um, you know, I would say they don't, I imagine they wonder, I do, you know, just kind of like in my day-to-day -day life, I'll, I'll get people say, you wrote a book about horsemanship. Like, you know, that's, I'm like, it's a huge thing. You have no idea. There's tons of like, there's all different kinds of styles. It's like, it's a, you know, um, my, my colleagues don't because it, again, you know, your colleagues in, in academia, they just sort of trust you. And so it's like, well, if you studied it, it must, it must have some validity. Right. So that's a nice part of that world. I'm sure privately, you know, there's some wondering about, and just not knowing about this, you know, this group of, of, people who are so passionate about horses, I will say, you know, everybody knows the phrase, the horse whisperer. So that's done so much for popular culture. Right. And so often I would tell people, non-horse people, I'm like, it's, it's the horse whisperer thing. That's what I'm writing a book about. Like it's actually the origins of that idea and phrase and approach. And so, and then they are like, oh, okay. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that, and I would say in, especially in the U S and certainly in the Western U S, you know, horses, still even for people who are not involved with them still occupy such a profound place in the american imagination and in our popular culture that i think that other americans give me the benefit of the doubt because horses are such an important part of our history mm -hmm. and they probably would be surprised that some people are still so taken with them but i don't think it's as much of a jump for them as we might think it would be because of because of their place in our history Mm -hmm. that's good to know that's good to know. <laughs> um okay I have like a whole list of things but I feel like I feel like this has gone really well I'm very excited about this interview oh, um <laughs> tell glad me. I wasn't as socially awkward as I usually am oh I'm no, no. So that's, <laughs> I, you know I just I love them so I speak from that place yeah yeah well um Okay, one other term that I want to ask about um, for you to to explore is um, I love the term that you use, the pragmatic hope um, of people moving forward. So maybe talk a little bit about that sense. Yeah, so I started looking to philosophy, um, you know, when I was uh, analyzing the interviews and also it it you know, the philosophy, people's philosophies about horsemanship started coming out in the interviews. I didn't ask about them originally. And so what I learned was that when you ask people about the work that they are dedicated to doing, right? And as you know, it's not an easy lifestyle. Um, certainly if you're a professional, you try to make a living from it. Um, they want to talk about that philosophy. And so certainly in the later interviews, I asked about it more specifically with the mentors and, and, and again, if I were going to do a follow-up, it would be to ask folks, what is your philosophy of horsemanship? Because I found such interesting answers came out of that. Um, and so then when I was analyzing, writing it up, I looked to philosophy uh, as a way to just kind of organize some of my findings. And that idea comes from Sarah Stitzline. I hope I'm pronouncing her last name right. It's a philosophy professor. And you know, of course there's pragmatism and horsemanship, right? And so I was thinking about pragmatism all throughout. I'm not a philosopher by training. And so I, but I have a, a very strong interest in it, even though I have a PhD, um, I wouldn't describe myself as a philosopher. And so I'm interested in it as a learner as well. And I just thought that, so I was reading around, right? As I'm writing the book and and I found, found that idea of pragmatic hope very fitting. Um, you know, I'd already thought of pragmatism in horsemanship and just because of the practical elements, sort of obvious reasons, right? And so, but the hope that is that is at work when you are trying to carry on a tradition that um, is is ever harder to to carry on, right? And really any form of horsemanship, but especially one that, you know, is in the Southeast and outside of the Western US that is more isolating, and there aren't as many resources. 
I just thought you must be hopeful to do that work, right? And you must be hopeful about what it will bring you in your horsemanship journey. Like hope must be at work there, strongly at work. And so I thought, I thought it was fitting. So, you know, when you're writing up something like this, it's, you know, you're, you're trying to explain to the reader, here's what I found. And here are some other resources that might illuminate what I found. And so I thought that that worked well to think about horsemanship in general, but certainly this form of horsemanship as having this element of pragmatic hope and also just hope working with horses because it's such hard work, right? I mean, you know, I think it's so incredibly brave that, you know, people will approach horses and they have no idea how that's going to go, right? I mean, there's, you know, the stakes are so high. I mean, they're, they're life and death and yet you believe in the work and you're committed to it. That has to be a hopeful endeavor. Good answer. Um, so on the subject of hope, what is your hope you've given birth to this work that took so long to, to create? Um, what is your hope for this book in the world? Oh, you know, I, so I was generally as an academic, you write for other academics. I didn't do that in this book, even though I know it still seems academic. I did actually try to make it a lot more, a lot geared towards a, a wider audience, which was hard. And I, you know, because you can't subtract the ag kind of drier academic elements, right? Like my dad started reading it and he's like, I thought this was going to be more about horses. I'm like, <laughs> just, just hang in there. <laughs> It is more about horses, but I have to get all this other academic stuff done. Um, so, but I did, I did think of a more general audience that was, would be interested in horses or was already into horsemanship. I do hope that it brings some attention to the people working within it, not just the ones I highlighted, but also people who are practicing this, this fair approach to horsemanship that I think is fairer to the horse than many other kinds of horsemanship. Again, as an outsider, I'm saying that. Um, I do have a lot of anecdotal experience. I've been around horses since 2010 as an adult, right, as a learner. So I've seen different traditions at work, right? Um, but I am still an outsider. But just having seen what I've seen, I think this is potentially so fair and just to the horse. And and I would love to see people get curious about it and perhaps overcome any hesitation they have. I mean, I think one thing that that we have going for us with Vaquero Horsemanship is that it is the horse whisperer thing, right? And so that people know what that means and that Buck Brandeman is so has been so high profile, right, in his career. And so there is just kind of general cultural knowledge about it. And but if if people would really get into and seek out some folks that could work with them because there is so much that's unfair and unjust in horsemanship. I feel confident saying that even as an outsider. Mm -hmm. And so I would love to see, and of course I, I do realize that, you know, it all depends on the person. So it's not that these horse people are saints, right. Or that they never lose their temper or their, I don't mean to hold it up that way, but I do think that if you are following the philosophy that comes to us from the Dorrances and Ray Hunt, even more so than historical, which we don't know a lot about, but many people feel like was probably harsher. Um, but if you if you follow, you know, that's why when I highlight the kind of what I call the primary text of horsemanship, right? And so if you, and certainly Buck Branham and, and other folks who've carried that work on, I think that, you know, that 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 their approach is inherently fair, I would argue, and fair to the horse. Um, and so the the title is kind of a double thing. So like the horses are beautiful, that's why they're fine, but they're also fine because they're okay, because they're being treated well, right? They're, they're allowed to be horses and they're not forced to, in service of human vanity is what I like to say. I think there's a lot in horsemanship that is in service of human vanity. And Vaqueta Horsemanship, I didn't see that. Not mm -hmm. to say that it never happens, but I don't think it's dominant. And so I, I hope people get interested in it. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's the, I mean, the, the riddle that I'm always constantly trying to solve is the, the horse world is this thing that is so insular in its little groups. And I, I feel 
like there's like you feel connection when you're part of one of those groups but how do you get people to look at a different group and say they have something to offer that might be in addition to what I'm doing um, and not be, you know, like the flat hat thing that I said, like that's a repellent to some people. Right. Uh, and so they go, what does that person have to teach me about, you know, jumping a Grand Prix course? So, I mean, it's this, it's constant, it's a constant challenge. And that's a huge hurdle. I know I, I, I said to one of my friends, I said, I think the people who buy my book are going to already be interested in it. And she said, well, how do you reach the people who, and I said, I don't know, that's a question for like a PR person. And, and that's not really the kind of work I do, but it's, yeah. How do you cross those disciplinary boundaries? Right. I mean, ideally, you know, I would write about this for other horse publications that are read by people who don't necessarily know about this. Right. And so, yeah, but it's, it's, that is a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. I, I totally get that. And I felt that too, because yeah. you, you know, you, that's just kind of human nature too, right? We're all kind of segmented into our little groups and, you know, there's so much that pe horse people are busy. Like there's just, it's a busy lifestyle. And so, mm -hmm. you know, there's not necessarily, I think they don't necessarily get out of their own mindsets, partly for pragmatic reasons, because they're just busy, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a, there's a lot involved in caring for horses. And so that makes it even more of a challenge, but I get that. I feel that too. Um, and I don't know what the answer is, except that, you know, social media, I think helps a lot. And sorry. Sorry, I was going to sneeze, but then it went oh, away. Okay. So, yeah. so I think technology can, I think technology yeah. can help, which of course, you know, you're at the forefront of that. So I think being out on the internet and social media is, can be hugely helpful because I think people can stumble across resources yeah. that they might not otherwise would have. Well, and that's like the, you know, the, the path to, to searching for better horsemanship is often you know, a horse that, that, that is dangerous or they've already gotten in a wreck and you're like, gosh, wouldn't it be great if they could care about it before they got hurt or before they encountered a horse that was so troubled, you know? So that's, anyway, huh. that's what I'm always working on. Yeah. So, um, what question didn't I ask you that you <laughs> want to talk about? Hmm. I don't know. I think you were very comprehensive. <laughs> um, Oh, I, you know, nothing comes to mind. I, I think, yeah, I think we covered a lot of ground. I feel like we did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I really enjoyed reading it and I know that I'm going to go back again because, um, it really like, you know, I'm underlining like, and, you know, oh. writing in the margins and it's like, Ooh, this feels so good to use my brain in this way. Like it I'm really challenged me. I'm so happy to hear that. That's very, very rewarding for me to hear because you, you work on something like this and, you know, you can relate as a horse person, like you work in isolation, uh, for doing a lot of your work. So writing, as you know, too, is very isolating work. And for me, very slow. I'm not, again, I don't know that I ever want to write a book about something I care so much about because it was just, you know, it was very slow. And so, you know, and then it's out of your hands and you're like, wow, I, you know, I don't know what people think or, or, you know, what their read of it is. And so that's, it's wonderful to hear. Um, it means a lot to me that it's coming from you, especially. So thank you. I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you for taking the time to write this book. And I hope everybody picks up a copy because it's well worth the read. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for um, having me. It's been a highlight of my year for sure. Awesome. Well, you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.